preach on a thought, the marks of friendship. Here a week or so ago in my daily devotion, that was the title of the daily devotion. And I, I'm not sure, I listened to it again, but they, they were not talking along these lines. But they, they used these verses, but they went in a different direction of what the Lord was beginning to deal with me on. But I want to talk about the marks of friendship. When you begin to think about friendship, you have to ask ourselves this question. What marks someone as a friend? What would you consider that mark of a good friendship? Uh, my, my best friend and I, we have a unique relationship because we live so far away. I, I live here, obviously, and he lives in Oklahoma. And there's been times that uh, Miles has separated us and for a short while, I lived in Oklahoma, but still, I was on one side of the state, and he was on the other side of the state. And I have another close friend that we don't speak very often. He lives here locally, but our lives are very busy. But with those three friends, maybe those who follow me on Facebook have seen a picture of us three uh, before in robes. It was on a old-fashioned Sunday, and they said that we're to dress old-fashioned, and that's usually when people put on coveralls and straw hats and bonnets and, and all of those things and suspenders, but, but we wanted to go old-fashioned day. We said, you don't get no old fa- more old-fashioned than going back to the Word. So we were trying to be biblical, and we should have won. We still say today we should have won because nobody there dressed any older than us, but we were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so we, we just had that kind of friendship. We were goofy. We were silly. And, and, but I was there the night that my younger friend got filled with the Holy Ghost. We were doing a Bible study on Halloween night. My, uh, my best friend that lives in Oklahoma, he was back home after he had left the military. He was here, sir. That's how I met him. He served in the military here, and he went back home to Oklahoma. And he called us and told us that his mom was not doing well, and they didn't expect her to live. Well, without hesitation, me and uh, Travis, my other friend, we got in a vehicle, and we drove 18 hours across, halfway across the country to be there with him for whatever may have occurred, whatever would have happened. We was there with him. Thank God at that moment his mom did not pass. She later passed a a couple of years later, but at that time she did not. But we were there by his side. I was in Oklahoma pastoring, and, uh, and Bill's on the other side of the state. He drove from his side of the state, came through Broken Bow, where I was at, and picked me up. And we drove all the way back to Florida when our friend Travis, when his dad passed away, uh, and it was time for his uh, funeral. And we served as pallbearers in that funeral. We made that trip. Uh, I, I consider those marks of friendship. And I'm thankful that what I've done for them, that they do for me. And uh, it's good to have friends. It's good to have those marks of friendship. And many of us may have a different opinion of what marks someone as a good friend. It's important that a friend is there for you. It's always, a friend is not one that always says the right thing. Sometimes a friend doesn't say anything. They're just there when you need a friend. They're just there with you in those hard places in your life uh, uh, just to, to be there. Uh, after driving all the way across the country uh, and, and coming to the funeral, Travis is much like me, a man uh, a few words. That's me outside the pulpit, a man a few words. Uh, and when I walked up to him, uh, I didn't say much to him, and he didn't say much to me. Uh, but we grabbed each other, embraced, I, I hugged him, and he hugged me, uh, and he knew there that his friend was there. Uh, that's the marks of friendship. Uh, if for many of us we can say well this marks friendship for me uh, and I know that I'll call and they'll answer if I need and they're there uh, whatever I need they've got my back uh, you may reflect on your friends today and your best friends but our text tells us that there has no, great, no greater love than this uh, than a man laid down his life uh, for his friends uh, and over the last few weeks we've talked about how Jesus did that for us how he, uh, he was beaten cruelly beaten uh, and hung upon that cross and those wounds that he bore. Isaiah prophesied of it and said it was going to come to pass that he was bruised for our transgressions. That He took those wounds for us. That the chastisement of our peace was upon him. That he took that cruel beating, died on the cross of Calvary for you and I. And he said no greater love than this and a man would lay down his life for his friends. And he said here you are my friends. 
servants. Uh, if you do so whatsoever I command you, uh, henceforth I call you not servants, uh, for a servant know not what his Lord doth, but I have called you friends. Uh, for all things that I have heard of the Father I have made known uh, unto you. Uh, what is he saying here? Friends don't keep secrets. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you so. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I'm letting you know uh, that all of that has been done, that it is finished, is what he said there uh, as he hung there on the cross. Uh, that Jesus said, it is finished. Uh, and one songwriter put it this way and said, uh, when he said it was finished, that was just the beginning for me. And he said, now uh, I have gone through all of that. I have bore the marks. Uh, I have paid that price on Calvary's hill. Uh, and he said, I go to my father's house. Uh, and he said, from this time forward, uh, whatever the father tells me, uh, I will reveal it to you uh, through the Holy Ghost. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. Uh, I will give you another comforter. Uh, this is a friend, not only a friend that would die for us, uh, but a friend that says, you're always going to be taken care of. How many remember reading something like this? My God shall supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory. By who? By my friend, Christ Jesus. How can you say that you're a friend of God? Because my desire is to keep His commandments. And here this morning, it's simple. You want to be a friend of God? Keep His commandments. And to understand that there are marks of that friendship. And he said that those marks of that friendship will overflow. Uh, it's Sister Underwood shared with us uh, before she sung this morning, our relationship with others, that we'll begin to love one another. That price, the, the first message that I, I preached in this series of messages was, I was wounded, but I rose above it. I was wounded, but I rose above it. We talked about how Jesus went to that cross and how he was beaten and how they put the nails in his hands and his feet and how he took that cruel tree for you and me and how that he came and he told them, go tell my disciples and Peter. That's, that's significant in itself because last time we saw Peter, he denied him three times said, I'm not his friend. He said, I, I have no acquaintance with him whatsoever. She said, oh, no. That damsel said, no, your speech gives you away. You, you speak as one of those that have walked with him. But he denied him three times. He, he kind of acted like a toddler on the playground when they get upset. I'm not your friend anymore. Consequences of that the action of him being a friend. He said, no, I don't know him. That's the last that we hear of Peter uh, running out and weeping because he's caught in that moment. Uh, he recalled, he called eye contact. One writer said he looked through uh, and saw Jesus. Uh, when he said that, made eye contact. His heart sunk within him uh, because he remembered his words uh, that he told him, you'll deny me three times. And when he did, he ran out and he wept bitterly. But when Jesus rose from the dead after he died for his friends, he didn't just die for the ones that did not deny him. He didn't just die for the ones. Matter of fact, Scripture tells us in John 6, along around verse 66, that many of his disciples followed him no more because he told them that they could not serve him lest they drink his blood and eat his flesh. Speaking of communion, he didn't, they didn't get that. They thought, man, this dude's gross. And they walked away from him. He looked at his disciples and said, Would you also go away? Scripture tells us as he went to, his, to the cross uh, that all of his disciples went in different directions uh, and Peter was the only one that followed him but followed him afar off uh, and then he denied him. Uh, but when Jesus rose from the dead, uh, he made this statement, Go tell my disciples uh, and Peter that I want to speak with them. Uh, and he showed himself unto them uh, and he showed them that he was not dead, that he was not in that grave. Uh, he, he showed them uh, that he had authority and power uh, and he began to explain to them even more uh, his intent and his plan for their lives uh, but we read there and understand uh, that Thomas was not there and Thomas got a bad rap because he acted just like all of us would act if this happened to us today amen we call him how many know what we
I shall see in his hands uh, the print of the nails and put my fingers uh, into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Uh, why did he say that? Because the last time that Thomas saw Jesus, he hung on a cross. Possibly he was standing down there and watching uh, as Joseph and Nicodemus removed him from the cross uh, and placed him in a grave. Uh, but the last time he saw Jesus, he was dead. Uh, the last time that he saw him, uh, though he uh, knew him to be the Messiah, though he, though he knew him to be his friend, uh, and though he treated him with such compassion, uh, though he laid down everything to follow him, uh, he said that was short-lived. Uh, those three and a half years are over. Uh, it's done. It's finished. Uh, he is dead. Uh, and if you say that you saw him, you're messing with him. Don't mess with me like that. Because he loved the Lord. He was a friend of Jesus. And he wanted so much for him to be there. Have you ever had somebody tell you something that you did not believe? We'd say something like this. Shut your mouth. Right? I don't believe that. That's not even possible. That, that's not even possible that that could occur. I was wondering why I wasn't getting any amens. That, that is not possible that that could even happen. I will not believe it until I see We call him Doubting Thomas, but yet we say things like seeing is believing. A picture is worth a thousand words. Well, he, he said that. He said, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were with them, and Thomas with them. Get this now. The one that Thomas thought was dead. The one that Thomas saw uh, and figured he has been dead, not three days, uh, but this has now been eight days on top of those three days, uh, on top of whatever time had elapsed in there. Uh, it had been close to two weeks uh, that Thomas had thought, my friend is gone. Uh, no greater love. Uh, he loved us so much that he laid down his life for us. Uh, but listen, he didn't just love us enough to die for us. Uh, he said, I'm he that was dead, uh, am alive, uh, and I live forevermore. He wouldn't have did Thomas any good on the cross. He wouldn't have did Thomas any good in the grave. He doesn't do any of us any good on the cross. He doesn't do any of us any good in the grave. But He is risen. He is risen indeed. And thank God, He said, I'm at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and me. So Thomas comes to a gathering of friends. Get this now. He gathers with his friends, though they've been messing with him, he thought, telling him Jesus is alive. And eight days, eight days had passed since they had told him, Jesus is alive. No, he's not. I won't believe it. He didn't come instantly on the scene, but it says it was eight days later. After eight days, again, the disciples were then, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. Oh, if we get a hold of that this morning. Oh, I love it, Brother uh, Leroy, when we gather together in the house of God on Sunday morning with friends. I was watching the video of uh, last week's service, and Sister Amy kind of records a few minutes before service. Uh, when We're gathered with friends. We're walking around. How are you doing? How's your week been? Uh, things have been good. Things haven't been so good. Uh, this is going on. That's going on. Uh, fellowshipping with our family. Uh, fellowshipping with our friends. We're gathering together with friends. Uh, oh, it's good to gather together uh, with friends on Sunday morning, uh, Sunday night, Wednesday night, wherever we can gather together. Uh, it's so and soul's house or at the restaurant wherever we can get together uh, with our friends that are part of the family of God uh, but this is what makes it a gathering uh, when the friend of all friends uh, the friend that laid down his life for his sheep uh, the friend that does not call me servant uh, but he calls me friend uh, because he said I'm not keeping anything from, from you uh, but I got all things for you uh, I'm not holding anything back uh, but I'm giving it all to you uh, he says here uh, that as he gathered together with his other friends uh, it's said right there in the midst of them uh, then came Jesus uh, oh this morning uh, it, as she sung this morning uh, I just want to be in his presence uh, but Thomas said I'll never be in his presence again uh, because I saw when they killed him uh, I saw when he hung on the cross uh, I saw when they placed him in the grave uh, and rolled the tomb to the door uh, I'll never get to see my friend again but then he came into the room then he stepped into the room and he didn't even use the door 
He didn't even use the door. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Thomas needed some of that about right then, didn't he? Eight days. Eight days on top of the time that his other friends and disciples had already went through the torment. If he's gone, what do I do now? John, last chapter of John tells us Peter didn't know what to do. He said, I don't know what to do. Go on fishing. What did God tell him? Lay down your nets, and I'll make you fishers of men. That's the only thing he knew was fishing. He said, I don't know what else to do. When we don't know what to do, when we don't have direction, we've not heard from God, uh, when we believe God is gone, when we believe that God is dead, uh, when we believe that God has finished, uh, when we believe that, God, that we have failed God or we've missed the mark uh, and we're not in His presence anymore. Uh, he had walked with Jesus every day for three and a half years uh, and now here He was. Uh, Jesus was not walking with Him. Uh, we find Peter not knowing what to do. It's the same with us. Uh, when we're not in His presence, uh, when we're not walking in His presence uh, and they're hearing from Him uh, and as John the Beloved leaning on his bosom uh, and hanging on his every word uh, and standing up, Peter was quick to stand up and say, no, wait a minute. Uh, thou art the Christ, uh, the Son of the living God. To whom shall we go? He said, there's nowhere else to go. Uh, so understand, that's where Peter was at. Uh, this is where Thomas was at. Uh, these are where these men were at. He said, I don't know what else to do. Uh, so I'm just going to do what I always did. It's the same with us. Same with us. That when we are not in His presence, when we don't see the marks of His friendship, we'll do the same thing. We'll just go back and do what we know to do. I'll just go back and depend on what I've always depended on. Because I'm not sure if I can depend on my friend anymore. Because they thought He's not here. He's not with us anymore. But they forgot. They forgot. Scripture tells us this, that they forgot the words of Jesus. That he told them that they will, they will kill me. They will to destroy this temple. But in three days, but in three days, I'll rise, raise it up again. They forgot that he said, I will never leave you or forsake you, but I'll be with you always. As I said about my best friend, He's all the way in Oklahoma, a thousand miles, over a thousand miles away uh, right now. He's not physically with me, uh, but he's still my friend. He's still that friend uh, that will stick closer to me than any of my brothers. Uh, he is still there. One phone call uh, to him, uh, he'll come running this way. One phone call from me, uh, I'll go running that way because that's the marks of friendship. Uh, but Peter is saying, I don't see him. Uh, Thomas said, I don't see it. Uh, they thought it was over. Uh, they thought, well, I heard him say, it is finished. They thought that was the marks. They thought that was the end. They thought that was the answer. They was thought that that's how all of this is supposed to end. Because my friend, my master, my Messiah hung on a cross. And I heard him say it. How many remember reading it or heard it preached? He said, it is finished. He said it's finished. He's dead. He's gone. It's done. Peter said, I'm going fishing. And Thomas said, I don't believe it. I don't care if you say you saw him, you heard from him. I don't believe it. But right there in the midst, then came Jesus. Then said he to Thomas, Get this. Reach hither thy fingers, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. What was he showing Thomas there that day? in that room with the other disciples as he appeared to them again, uh, as he walked into that room, uh, and as he reached out those hands that had been nailed to that cross. Those hands, mind you, that we talked about uh, how Joseph had to tenderly and, and, and compassionately but forcibly uh, remove them from the cross. So we know there were deep wounds there. Uh, it was placed in his hands. Uh, there was no blood in that room. Uh, he had already gathered with them and told them, drink of this cup. This is the blood uh, of my New Testament. Uh, now listen, uh, Joseph already wiped the blood away. He already wrapped him in a clean linen cloth. Uh, he had already cleaned him up. He had already, uh, he had already touched him. He had already been 
uh, uh, raised from the dead. Uh, he had already gone to the key and taken the keys to death, hell, uh, and the grave. Uh, but what Joseph uh, did there is he cared for that body. But what Thomas saw there that day uh, is Jesus reached out his hands. Uh, he looked at those hands uh, and he said, You want to put your hands, uh, your, your fingers in there? Go ahead. Uh, there they are. Uh, there, there's that mark in my side. You remember uh, when that soldier put that spear in my side? Uh, he did that after I was dead. Uh, he go ahead uh, and put your hand in there. You can do it. Uh, what was he doing there? What was unfolding uh, in these verses of Scripture? What's going on here? Uh, Jesus holds out his hands. Uh, he's telling Thomas, uh, do you remember uh, that I told you uh, and that I told the other disciples uh, that no greater love than this uh, and a man would lay down his life uh, for his friends. I laid down my life for you. Uh, I did this for you. Uh, I hung on that cross for you. You. I took the punishment of sin for you, but it's for my father, that my father's plan, and he didn't leave me hanging there, that they put me in the grave, that the father had a plan. And he said, what I'm showing you, what he was showing Thomas there that day, was the marks of friendship. He said, right here in these hands, Thomas, is nothing more and nothing less than the marks a friendship. Right here in my side, you will find the marks of friendship. No greater love than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. You know what Thomas answered? You know what Thomas said to that? I've told you this before. I don't see where he reached out and put his hand in his side or he put his finger and said, wow. I, I don't read that. This is what, this is what I, I read. You may have Another version of the Bible where I may have missed something. But all I see is Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord, my God. Seeing is believing, Thomas said. And he said, if it takes you to see to believe, I'll show you. He said, look at the marks of friendship. Easter's come and gone. People who have gathered in churches on Easter Sunday, they, they've made their way back to uh, whatever they do the rest of the year. But those who keep His commandments, those who know Him as friend, they gather again, gathered again on Wednesday night, gathered again on Sunday morning, gather, will gather again and again and again and again because we want to experience the same thing that they experienced there, that Jesus stepped in the room. Then came Jesus. And as you look at the image that we, that we have, Sister Amy picked so wonderfully uh, right there in his hands, what is Jesus saying in that picture? He is saying to us, this is the marks of friendship. He is saying, this is what I have done for you, Thomas. This is the price that I paid for you. Uh, he said, uh, and, and the, the prophet told us uh, that he said, where did you get those wounds? He said, I received them in the house of my friends. This is what it meant to, to my friends. This is what I meant to, to my friends, but this is what I meant to my friends. He said, this is what they did to me. He said, but things are going to change now. He said, if you're going to be my friend, you've got to keep my commandments. He said, if you're going to be my friend as often as you partake of communion, as often as you remember Easter, as often as you remember that price, he said, you do it and you remember me. James 2 and 23 tells us this. He said, the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. We understand that what James is talking about here is it was saying that Abraham became a friend of God not because he had faith in God, not just because he believed God, but he acted upon that faith. You think about Abraham. He said, Abraham, go and offer your only son Isaac. It took faith for him to hear the voice of God and accept that that's what he was supposed to do. But it took an act of obedience to gather the wood, to gather the sun, to gather the servants, and to take that journey to that mountain, to place that sun upon that altar, 
and to go all the way, willing to go all the way to offer that sacrifice. It was not just his faith, but it was the works. By the works was he justified. To understand that he went all the way to that to fulfill that purpose and to put that faith to action. And it tells us, Thomas said, that he, as he states, told him about what Jesus did, he said, I will not believe. I will not believe have faith. I cannot have faith in believing because I don't see it. And now as he gathers there and he sees that, Thomas and those other disciples come out of that room. They come out of that room and they get a mandate from God. There's several that gathered with them there. Some scholars say 500 gathered on a hillside there that day when he told them what to do now. He said, this same Jesus that you see taken, he's going to come again. But he said, I must go to my Father. It's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the Comforter cannot come. The plan cannot be fulfilled. He said, it has to be done. They had faith in what he said, but faith was not enough. There was possibly many of that 500 there that day that believed what he said and had faith in what he said to know that he said, I go and I will come again. But they did not follow through on that faith. Because it tells us that only 120 of them, only 120 of them made the trip to Jerusalem. He said, go to Jerusalem and tarry there until you be endued with power from on high. It tells us that Thomas made that journey. All the disciples made that journey. They gathered there in that upper room. He could have very easily said, I saw it, I believe it, that's wonderful, that's great. But he followed through. He said, he showed me the marks of his friendship. I'm going to show him the marks of my friendship. Throughout this Easter season, we have talked about uh, these marks of friendship, what he did for us uh, as a friend of God, uh, what our friend, uh, what God has done for us, the price that he's paid for us, the marks uh, that he took for us, uh, the marks uh, of his friendship for us. He said, but if you're going to be my friend, uh, you've got to keep my commandments. Uh, So 120 of them said, uh, he said, go, uh, I'm going. Uh, He said, go to Jerusalem, I'm going to Jerusalem. Uh, He said, when I get to Jerusalem, uh, go to that upper room. They followed every detail of what he said because they said, I want to be a friend of God. I want to bear the marks of friendship for him as he bore the marks of friendship for me. So they made it to that upper room. Abraham believed God. It was imputed to him for righteousness. Disciples believed God. It was imputed to them for righteousness. Uh, Throughout the ages, men and women have believed God, uh, and it was imputed to them for righteousness. Uh, How were they called a friend of God? Uh, Because they kept His commandments. That's the only way uh, now that we can be called a friend of God is if we keep His commandments. If we follow through with what He's told us to do. He said, you see then how that by works a man is justified, not by faith only. We must, too, bear the marks of friendship. Thomas said, I see the marks of his friendship. Now it's time for him to show me to show him the marks of my friendship. Peter and the other said, I see the marks of his friendship. Now I'm going to show him the marks of my friendship. Scripture tells us that they turn the world upside down. They added to the church daily. Daily. They was fellowship and meeting together in houses. 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost. Souls were added every day. Why? Because they were bearing the marks of friendship. We can see very clearly and understand through the Easter story from the prophet Isaiah all the way up to the Gospels and the recap of it in Paul's writings and Peter's writings on into the New Testament that he bore marks for our friendship to show us how much he loves us and how far he was willing to go that we might have life and we might have it more abundantly. That you and I don't have to grope in darkness. That you and I don't have to stay in a sinner's state. That we don't have to stay in a hopeless condition. But that we can be redeemed we can be born again 
But now it's up to you and I. He said, if you're going to be my friends, keep my commandments. We need to also bear the marks of friendship with Jesus. Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. Sister Gilda, if you'll come this morning. Would you stand with me all over the house? He said, from henceforth, let no man trouble me. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I don't have to worry about man. This is someone who has heard the words of Jesus said, don't fear him who can destroy the body. But him that can destroy the body and soul in hell. Take up daily your cross. Any man will be my disciple. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow after me. So he declares here, writing to the Galatians, Paul says this, from henceforth, let no man trouble me. Maybe you've let people trouble you. Maybe you've let people get to you. Maybe you've let people distract you. Maybe you've let others doubt, instigate you, intimidate you. You need to make this statement with Paul this morning and say, from henceforth, that just simply means from this day forward. From this moment on, no man's going to trouble me. No man, no woman's going to trouble me. They're not going to get me. They're not going to get to me. They're trying to place fear in my heart, doubt in my mind. He said, from henceforth, let no man trouble me. Why? For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What is he saying? He's saying something that he wrote and we preached here a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He said, I've presented my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. It's my reasonable service. And I'm not conformed to this world, but I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind that I may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. He said, I've gone through all the stages. You've got to go through all the stages, friend of God. You got to go through all the stages as God's friend. He's your friend. You keep his commandments. Saying, I'm going to do that good, and I'm going to go beyond the good to the acceptable. And why many will tell me and trouble me and say, Acceptable is good enough. You can say, You stay here in the acceptable will of God all you want. I'm going all the way to that perfect will of God. He said, no man's going to trouble me. Don't let anybody hold you back. Be it husband, wife, brother, sister, neighbor, co-worker, family. I don't care who it is trying to hold you back. Make up your mind this morning from henceforth. From henceforth. uh, Let no man trouble me. Because I am a living sacrifice. I am submitted and committed to the will of God I am a friend of God I am a friend of God and my friend needs me to be what he's told me to be he has revealed to me the father's plan for my life he's kept nothing from us sister Pat he's held nothing back brother Underwood he has showed us everything that the father wants that's what He's done for the church. Church, he just, we say in this year of Revelation, give me revelation. Uh, God's saying through His Son, uh, everything that I want you to hear, I'm going to let you hear. Uh, he's going to do it through the Holy Ghost, uh, through His Son. He said, I'm not holding anything back. That's why it's important to be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's why it's important to have uh, the seven gifts of the Spirit operating within the church. Uh, that's why it's important to have that fivefold ministry. Uh, that's why it's important uh, to know what uh, what thus saith the Lord. That's why it's important that we preach the Word of God. Because He is telling us, I, if I bear in the body of the marks of the Lord Jesus, no man's going to trouble me. So if you're troubled by the opinions of man, sell out. Sell out 
Submit yourself. Lay yourself across that altar. Say, I am thine, O Lord. Throw those hands in the air in total surrender uh, and say, God, I I belong to You. Uh, I'm going to walk in Your commandments. I'm going to walk in Your will and Your way. Uh, I want to know that when I leave here today, uh, that not only did He bear the marks of friendship for me, uh, but He said, I bear uh, in my body uh, the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm going to walk in His will and in His way. Church, it's time that we start start bearing in our body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? It means we're going to have to do some hard stuff. It means we're going to have to do some things that we don't want to do. This means that we're going to have to make some sacrifices. You probably get sick of hearing it, but I'm going to keep preaching it until I die. It means you're going to have to come to church when you don't want to. It means you're going to have to come to prayer meeting when you don't want to. It means you're going to have to witness to somebody when you don't feel like talking to somebody. It means that you're going to have to go beyond yourself and say, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. You've got to quit making it about us. Quit making it about other people's opinions. He said, I am going to bear the marks of friendship. I want them, Sister Mary, when they place me in a grave and bury me, maybe out here, maybe they'll let me be buried with the Baptists. They put me out there and they put a headstone. It would be all right if I outlived Sister Amy or my kids. They just simply put on there, here lies a friend of God. That would be enough for me. Here lies a friend of God. And I want to be able to say that with confidence. How do you know he was a friend of God? Because he bore the marks. Bore the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. She bore the marks. Are we bearing the marks? He bore them for us. He took the marks on Calvary for us. Are we willing to bear the marks? Mark me with that crowd. Mark me with the Lord Jesus Christ. You join a gang, they tell you, get this tattoo, do this, do that, that you can be marked with them. I don't have any of that, but I've been marked. You can call me Holy Roller, call me whatever you want to, but as long as they know that I am one of those. I'm not like Peter said, oh, no, 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 that's not me. I'm not one of those. I stand and tell you this morning, and I don't care who's listening. Put it out there on the web, Sister Amy, for everybody to hear. I'm one of those. I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many in this house this morning uh, would stand with pastor today, uh, meet me around these altars and uh, say, I too uh, bear the marks. Uh, I too am willing to bear whatever marks, uh, whatever it takes uh, to be marked with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, And when you make that commitment, uh, you will not be troubled by any man, uh, woman, boy, and girl. You'll be not troubled uh, by any imp or demon from hell uh, because you have made your mind up. I am marked as a friend of God. That's the marks of friendship. Father, as we step out all over this house, make our way to this altar, we're saying, mark me. Mark me as one of those. I bear the marks of His friendship. I'm a friend of God. I'm going to keep Your commandments. I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm not listening to man's opinion, but I'm listening for the voice of the Father, which is never held back from God's friends touch us today around these altars. We ask it in Jesus' name.